Welcome to the exclusive club that Dads Don't Want to Belong to podcast, hosted by Trevor Dwyer Lynch. Trevor speaks with dads about the loss of their son or daughter and asks how they cope, if indeed they cope at all. This podcast is proudly supported by the Manx Spirit Charity. Thank you for listening. Hi everyone, welcome to series two of the most exclusive club that dads don't want to belong to. So today, how am I? Uh, not bad, you know. Quite in a good, upbeat, positive mood. Just been there, uh, doing a bit of grounding, walking on the beach at Ainsdale. Don't know if you've ever been. But Ainsdale Beach, hidden gem. About 40 minutes from Manchester, 15 minutes from the centre of Southport. Brilliant, brilliant. Good for, good for the mind, good for the soul. I think it's something... Something about the scene, they. Anyway, so this week's guest, a uh, bit of a special one, really. Um, well, I'll let you listen and decide. I think it's a bit of a special one. So, yeah, this afternoon, uh, got a bit of a special guest. A lad that I know pretty well, although we've not met a lot in the physical terms, but throughout the football world, got a great passion for the game, although he has gone on to do a little bit better than me in his career. So uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself, mate, and tell people, uh, our listeners who you are and what you do. First of all, Trevor, thanks for having me on. It's a massive uh, achievement for me to get on this podcast and, and, and talk to what we're going to talk about. And um, I'm Dean Holden. Uh, lucky enough to be uh, a professional footballer. Don't know how, but I managed to, to do it. Uh, Twenty odd year career at all levels, from the Premier League down to League Two. Played out in Iceland, played in Scotland, and about ten years ago, got into coaching and uh, became the Bristol City head coach. Got sat from there, went to Stoke City as assistant manager. Then I was the Charlton manager this time last year. Got sacked at the start of the season, and I now. Seven weeks ago, rocked up over in Saudi Arabia working as Steven Gerrard's assistant manager. So. A bit of a uh, yeah, a bit of a crazy career, really, but loved every minute of it, and really grateful actually that I'm able to do something which I which I've loved since I was a kid. So yeah, that's, that's brilliant. Me. Yeah, great. That is is like I said, it's really weird when obviously we we've we've with each other via text, and then obviously the common denominator is that we're both coaches. You know what I mean? And really weird because I was like City for six years and United for twenty odd years. UEFA for being the community in the centre of excellence stuff. It's great, and obviously the lads we all cross over. Does that you know, I'll know, and blah blah blah. But it, it's amazing isn't it? that that passion that we have for the game it, and it, and what we learn in the game that helps us. I suppose it has helped me to come through this adversity. What I'm going to ask you is obviously the first question I'm going to ask you is like, um, if you're okay with it, if you can just please tell us a little bit about your daughter and uh, you know what happened uh, twelve years ago, mate. Yeah, thanks, Trevor. Um, I love talking about it because it, selfishly it, it helps me and hopefully yeah. we're in this uh, public eye that people call it, even though we're just two normal fellas, yeah. we're able to to use our platform to help other people. So, yeah, coming up on the 21st of May this year, it'll be 12 years since we went to Lanzarote on holiday, me and Danielle, TV presenter Danielle Nichols. We've been together since we were kids, grew up in Swinton. We had three kids under the age of four at one point and uh, we went to Lanzarote on holiday with... My brother, who's married to Daniel's sister and their two young kids. And um, we arrived there. We were delayed at Manchester, as you do. We get there at midnight, put the kids to bed. And seven o'clock next morning, CC, our little daughter, she was 17 months old. She woke up and she wasn't feeling so good. We decided to take her to the doctors before we went to the beach. And within two hours, she'd, she'd left us. The um, Surreal, isn't it, when you talk about it? I've not spoke about this for quite a while now. But, um, yeah, she, she she developed a rare form of meningitis, which the government didn't immunise for on the kids' immunisation programme back then. They, they do now. They have done for a number of years. And um, people say, oh, did you not do the glass test for the bruises? There was, mm. Trev, we were set up to fail. There was nothing to say. Yeah. She wasn't feeling so good. She had a bit of a groan. She was she, she sat in our lap in the, in the doctor's with a little drinky cup and... We walked into the doctors and um, there was a there was a lady in front of us and like I say there was no real panic at that point she was chatting away and the kids do and uh, 
within about a minute, this doctor came in and shone like a torch in her eye. And then this, and then it, it, it's like being in a scary movie. Then you know the alarm went, and there was doctors and nurses coming from every single corner of this this opera, uh, this hospital, and they grabbed her and picked her up like and just dragged her in. And then it was, and then it was all systems go. Then there was, she was plugged into everything, and and they were trying to save her life. And um, yeah, she died within within two hours and four. Obviously, so. You know, um, one of the things that I've um, recognised with this journey that we're, we're, we're in um, is that my boy was forty, and um, my sister she she lost she lost um, two couple of children actually. Uh, one is still birth. One was one was born, and um, when it first happened, she said to me. Oh yeah, I get your pain, I get your pain, I understand it. And I, I couldn't, me and Paul talked about this, I couldn't grasp this. What's she on about? What's she on about? She's not been through this, she's not been through this. My boy was 40, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. And then suddenly the light comes on, and we've had a couple of lads on this group who've lost their children with early at, at, at your daughter's your daughter's age. And the biggest thing that hit me, like someone punching me in the jaw, the jaw is like how lucky I was to spend 40 years with my lad. But then, like yourself and Danielle, only had um, 17 months. And for me, it's like, my sister says to me, the grief that she has is like, you're wondering how she would have been. Do you know what I mean? She would have grown up like, what skills she would have gone through, her personality, you know, if she would have boyfriends and all that thing. Do you know what I mean? Where in your blindness, in my blindness, of, of the grief because I I thought that you don't you don't think about that you think and then I went shit yeah she 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 does think that it's like how old would he have been now do you know what I mean and blah 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 and I think because you know you've got beautiful kids again now and I think that's probably one of the hardest things I suppose for you and Daniel when you you see your kids and you go what would CC would have been like with 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 a peer group you know what I mean with the siblings you know what I mean. There's a couple of things on that. It's really interesting conversation, isn't it? I mean, you're right. Every school year, you know, when she goes to high school, she'd be having a boyfriend and going and doing her exams and all them things. We. The second thing is, I stumbled across this group. I went past the local shop here in Worsley, where we live, Royal Green Post Office. And you know, it has like pictures in the window of like a, yeah. a cat's gone missing, and you have like a there's a wardrobe for sale and all that yeah. type of stuff. And it was this little. And I walked past it, clocked it, and it was basically a business card. For, it's called Compassionate Friends. I don't know if you've heard about them. And it's a charitable setup all over the country. And we, we went within two weeks of CC dying, and we went to this house in me and Danielle in, in Warrington. And it's this lovely couple, Maureen and Dave, who yeah, Brian Robson was my hero as a kid, and my old man is my hero. But my God, this couple gave us hope. They. 35 years before, had lost their son, 13 years old, snowballing fight with his mates, goes to bed, brain aneurysm, dies in his sleep. And they set up this group because she ended up in what they used to call a nut house back then, Maureen, yeah. and very open about their circumstances. Mm -hmm. And every month, every last Thursday of the month for 30 odd years, people, whether they turn up, they sit there, they, Dave makes a brew for everyone. People, you can bring a picture of your child if you want, you can talk about them, you can sit there in silence, you all light a candle, say a poem. And for an hour or a couple of hours every month, it allowed us to be in, in a room with like-minded people. And geographically where it was, there was families of Hillsborough victims there. There was all kinds, suicides and car accidents. And, and genuinely, my mum and, to, to your point there, my mum and dad at times, I remember them saying like, why do you keep putting yourself through that every month? Because of course it's horrific, the stories. Mm. I, I don't know how to describe it, Trev. I felt like I could talk to these guys Yes. But all for different reasons. CC, like you say, the age, but there's something you become, and I know you've talked about this part of this club that nobody wants to be a member of. But there is something in that where you can hold on to it and think, my family have been there for me and Danielle, our families. They both yes. live, uh, as I say, our brothers and sisters are married. All our sisters, everybody's been amazing for us, but nobody can help, can they, other than mm -hmm. give you some yeah. love and support and, and cuddle you and cry with you and and and... Be patient with you when, when you're going through that mad moment of your life um, where you're losing, you know, your personality changes and all these things, which you may or may not come on to. But there was something about these guys who you don't see ever other than for a couple of hours over a brew and you talk to them. And, and yeah, that, that really helped us. And that gave us 
And I really genuinely hope that, as I say, Danielle, she's got her own show on Talk TV now and she's doing well for herself again after COVID. She's found a career again and again got a bit of a profile for herself. And I really hope that people see me and Danielle married still, yeah. which is difficult, isn't it? The stats are against you within two years. All this scary shit you see on Google. And I hope they can look at us two and go, he's a coach, football coach. We're no different than anyone, whether you don't yeah. matter what job you've got, but people in society put you up on a pedestal. Of course they do. And I hope they can see us two progressing in our careers. As you say, we've gone on to have another couple of children since and actually think them guys have not made it because you'll never make it, but they're getting through each day. Yeah. And they're making the best of each day. And behind the scenes, of course, you fall off. You fall off at times, don't you? You have some mad experiences and, you know, you don't necessarily share them publicly, but I'm sure we've all had real dark, dark, dark times. But, yeah, I hope, and I hope this podcast really shines a light on that that there is hope because there is no hope, is there? No. I, I think hope's massively important, mate. No, I'm, I'm, a, think... I'm, I'm a massive believer in that and everything that we do, whether it be for a charity or, or whatever, it, even in some of the darkest, darkest situations. And I can never, what you said before, you know, I've spoke to Trev about this countless times. I can't understand what Trev's going through as a mate. I love him. I can't even empathize. I don't even think you can empathize with someone who's gone through the situation you guys have gone through. You can just be there if, if you need us, then even in these in the really dark situations, it's got to be a little glimmer of something. And and I think when people and that's what we've had with the episodes that we where we've done where there's been, to my surprise, a lot more hope than I thought there would be. And like the situation you've just said, you know, life moves on, doesn't it? You know, and, yeah. and the best thing that that can happen, or one of the best things that happen happen is that people in this situation can see someone they can relate to, another human being who's who's trying to cope. You know, the whole yeah, thing you're right. is really important. You, 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 are, you are completely right with that, Dean. And it's just like, you know, you just think that I said, I don't think, like yourself, Danielle, others that we've interviewed, there's no there's no way we can describe the pain, is there? There's no, that pain that you get. You know what I mean? It's like, we've all endured pain for whatever, you know, the reasons we've all endured grief. You know what I mean? But when it's a child, I don't know what it is. I don't know. I don't know where it comes from, mate. Like you said, like you, you know, Daniel, others been on the floor, holding me gut, my head's gone, da, 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 da. But like you say, the hope that I have, like you said, and I think I said to Paul the other week, I don't know what, I don't even know what drives me to do this, you know, at first. I, do, I couldn't get it. But then and my head's going, I'm thinking, it's me boy. My lad is actually mm. saying, yeah, go on, Dad, go and do something. And it's been difficult for me because like I said, you know, we'd, we'd fallen out. Over football, stupid. Over football, uh, and other things. You know what I mean. And but I have this thing that I said to Paul. I don't know what's driving me. Thing, but I think I think it is that. And whereas before, I'd um, I'd be in bits if I talked about him, and it would get me so emotional. I wanted people to talk about him because I wanted to still be alive. Yeah. In the you know what I mean? Like you say, always oh, talk about CC and da, 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 and never hide things. People say, oh, "I'm sorry to mention." No, no, don't be sorry. Talk about it. But um, now, like I said. The way that I transform it, Dean, is that if we do get upset talking about him, the metaphor for that is that he's connecting with me. Whereas before, I go to the cemetery every day. Still, people go, well, like you said, why, why do you still do that? Because I want him. But why is it? No. When I first went, it, it was doom and gloom, and it was always crying, and was sobbing, and was thinking, why, why, why? Now I go, sit 20 minutes with him, two hours with him, have a chat, talk about the 40, Talk about whatever. But if I get upset, it's because I feel like it's connecting with me. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I just think, yeah, for us to do what we do here, like I said, our first premise was just to get one person to listen to it. And then maybe it resonates and go, especially dads, like I said to you, and I keep reiterating that, where, where, where your missus will talk to her, her mum, her sister, her female friends, because women gravitate towards each other. And they'll talk about fucking everything, don't they? Everything. The other things, the personal things where, where men, we go, yeah, so how, how are you doing, Dean? You're all right in the pub. Yeah, I'm all right, mate. I'm okay. But we're not. So I think what I like about this as well, this podcast is now and what I'm seeing outside, like we mentioned before, our mate Simon Cooper, you know, the group that I've just joined, that wellness group. There's a shift now where men are realising in terms of right across the mental health spectrum that we do need to get out and talk. Mm. And again, I just got to say to you, you know what I mean, for you to... To come on and and, and, and talk is it means a massive a massive thing to us. Do you know what I mean? It means a massive. It's my thing. pleasure, and I wanted 
I wanted to say at the outset that it, it, it goes without saying, but I felt like I needed to say it to you that I know you'd have the fallout and stuff, and that must be. I mean, how much, you, you carry the guilt every day, don't you? You're meant to look yeah. after your children, however old they are. Yeah. But he knows or would have known that you would, as a parent, whether you fell out with them or not, you would run in front of a bus for your kid, wouldn't you? I mean, what yeah, what is that about love? Where this this human being it's different from mum because they're grown for nine months we just meet someone and within seconds you would throw yourself in front of a bus for it something yeah. grows in your body that never leaves does it and then when you have another kid you don't like have to give up some of that love for the next one you just grow more love from somewhere it's yeah. a, it's a surreal thing about being a parent but I, I wanted to say that to you because I can imagine the, the, the doom and gloom that you, you've gone through in your own head around the, you know the falling out and, and things like that I think you're right we don't go around with a slogan above our head do we say no I'm a I'm a bereaved parent and there are many more aren't they out there unfortunately that, that, that you think there are so rightly so that men are now being able to I mean suicide is the biggest killer of men under I can't remember the age group so yeah the more people can talk the better for me I don't see it as being I mean I'm obviously I just touched on it there at the beginning about my career and, and obviously I'm, I'm I'm really enjoying my role working with Stephen over in, in Saudi Arabia at the moment and you know, when I was manager of Charlton this time last year, I am very vulnerable in the media, in in front of the players. We lost the first uh, two games when I joined, and rather than showing them a video of the game, I showed them a picture of CC and said, "You know what?" And a few of the lads didn't understand, and I wanted them to know about me, yeah, because it opens up the room, and everyone in that room has got their own story. Not everybody has been unfortunate enough, me, and you, Trev, to to have lost a child, but everything's relative. To, so you might have lost a parent or whatever it is. And I just, I don't see a weakness whatsoever in it. And people have said to me, mate, you need to kind of be a bit more professional in your interviews because you're trying to put this persona across of, I see it as a real strength of mine. I'm not going to, I'm not going to change. If that means I don't get to the top in, in football management, because I'm prepared to talk about my private life and, and what we've been through and how marriage has been really tough. And we've come close a couple of times, particularly after COVID and we're honest enough to talk about that. I think that gives, as I say, hope to other people out there that we're not putting this, shiny light on our Instagram page and going as I tell you for nothing now we drove over Fellwall Viaduct me and Danielle and without Joey and Ellis who were our other two children at the time who were three and four years old we probably would have drove off it because the pain that you just touched on there Trev the physical pain I would have paid every penny I had and more to have eradicated CC's memory out of my brain to get rid of the pain so just wake up one day and just completely forgot about it just to get rid of the pain and obviously I've overcome that over the years and now I would never contemplate you know forgetting her ever but it, you're right the pain is so physical and the grief process is so off the charts and there's no thing such thing as a grief circle is there where you go from that to that to that and you know what the worst one is for me oh good days bad days biggest load of crap yeah. I've ever heard yeah. I'll have a good hour and then I'll be on my ass for 20 minutes. Then I'm laughing at someone's joke. And then I feel guilt. How can I be possibly laughing? My daughter's yeah. dying. All that. And the grief and the guilt is incredible. But you woke up this morning, Trev, and you've put your shoes on. You've brushed your teeth, I hope. Yeah, just, and you've got yourself on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you brush your hair. Yeah. And you've got yourself on a podcast. <laughs> and you're trying to inspire other people. And that, for me, is better than anything. So fair play to you. Yeah. Well, it's the same. I said to you, I think, and it's weird. I mean, you touched on it before about talking to people. And I said to Paul, I mean, um, obviously, the reason why we started it, you probably know, is because six mates of mine over 20 years have lost mm. sons or daughters, you know what I mean? And one kid in particular is the, on the verge of pro football at the time, but he lost his son. And uh, I said to Randy, you know, we're there to support him, but he was never, he was all on the periphery. What am I to expect? And he said to me, look, as when you lose a child, this is what he experienced. And exactly what you said, exactly what I've said, that unspeakable pain, you know, where you shout out, and sometimes I'm like, for fuck's sake, leave me alone. You know what I mean? It's there, I'm thinking like you said, you know, to get paid to get that away, to mm. get that away so you won't go through that again and blah, 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 blah. But I, I, I seen a thing the other day on, on Instagram where the girl was, she posted about losing a mum and she just said, um, the pain that I feel and blah, blah, blah. But what I have is, I go, it's grieve, breathe, and then believe. And the hope of whatever comes, comes. And when I, when I delve into her Instagram a little bit more, she lost her mum, she lost her dad, she lost her brother. I'm thinking, fuck it out. Do you know what I mean? But it is like you say, there is that little bit of thing that we try to make it into a positive. Because I do believe, I do believe that souls, I mean, I write more now, I write poetry and I use that as my grieving process. And I do believe that 
souls contact us by telepathy. I do believe in that. You know, when 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 we when we dream about when I dream about my son, he's talking to me. You know, I mean, I feel him sometimes. I felt I woke up and I've got someone in the room. It's that. Do you know what I mean? And I do I do strongly believe this. But touching on a little bit in terms of the football and like you say, the pressures that you face under that under that role, how how do you cope or still cope? How did you cope in the early days with your loss of CC? I know you, you, your football, you probably might have buried yourself, your head in that football. But how was that? How have you a coping strategy? Like I said to you, the date that she died, 21st of May, was the off-season, naturally. So I was out of contract that summer. I'd left Rochdale, just been relegated to lead two. It wasn't the greatest period of my career. Didn't have an agent. I was 30, 12 or 32. I weren't going to jump to the top of any manager's recruitment list. You know what I mean? I weren't a star yeah. striker or anything like that. So I got on the phone and I got the 92, uh, sorry, the 72. I realised I was probably not good enough for the Premier League at that point. So I, I managed through the PFA. I got the 72 phone numbers for every manager from Championship down and lead to in a rank every single number. And I wasn't prepared to... Because, you know, we didn't have a load of money behind us. People think professional football, TV, we, we didn't have a, a great deal of money behind us. I broke my leg at Bolton when I was 20 and my career was good, as good as it could have been, but nowhere near the level I wanted to get to. And I couldn't have gone out of... If we wanted to be bringing money in at that time, that would have been obviously another pressure. So I found another hero, and I should have mentioned him at the beginning, Dean Smith, who's now working over in the States, in Norwich City, Brentford, Aston Villa manager. He was a manager of Walsall at the time. And he was one of the few managers that answered the phone or rang me back. And I, and I went to meet him and the usual managers talk is, um, so have you got family? And, and it, this was three and a half weeks after Cece had, had died and he didn't, he didn't he didn't know he'd been on holiday, he, he weren't aware of it. Yeah. And him and his assistant, Mitch O'Kelly, was sat there with tears in their eyes and I told him the story. And he rang me the next day and he said, I'm just not sure because you're driving from Manchester to Birmingham every day for training and how it's going to impact you. And, and I said, have you made your decision? And he said, no. And I just... I'd started meditation at that point. Um, I'd started, we'd got away from the taking the antidepressants and we were going to go full-blown Wim Hof, ice baths, everything yeah. spiritual, try and yeah, yeah. get our minds as good as we can for our other kids. And I just blurted it out to him. I can remember it like it was this morning. I was, I was on the front lawn here at the house and I spoke to him on the phone on a summer's evening. And I, I've got so much respect for him that he didn't say, oh, you're 32, or... We, we've not got the budget or he went I'm just not sure and he listened to me and he went I'm going to do it and he signed me and I went on to play for him I became a player coach I learned the ropes of management and coaching under him and Richard O'Kelly and they just without them two we've seen him at the PFA Awards there in the Lowry a couple of months ago and Danielle just burst into tears when she seen Dean and she gave him a big hug and she genuinely said to him all right mate it's all right keep it real but it's all right she genuinely said to him I don't know where we would be without you because you don't know do you I could have drifted out the game. I could. I had no nothing behind me. I'd left school at 16, got to Bolton as a YTS, got in the first team, and that was May football. So yeah. that pre-season, I just, I, pre-season's tough, as you yeah. probably know. I was an animal, something inside me, man. I was at the front of all the running. I was I was flying fitness-wise, and that got me through. That got me through. Danielle was at home. With, Danielle was at home with our two young kids and having to sort of go through her process. I had... We did an interview recently for a magazine, The Brood magazine. You might have heard of him. And um, yeah. she burst out crying when she said, like, Dean's my hero because he didn't get the time to grieve because he went straight back to work. And and I flipped that on his head and think, I, I probably didn't, but I had my teeth into something else, which is I'm going to keep my career going against yeah. the odds. Mm. Simple as that. Nothing was going to stop me. And I've not looked back since, um, luckily, but... You just, I think you find people at the right time in life. I know we're getting a bit spiritual and stuff now. I, I genuinely think people, when you really need them, they turn up. You know, I manifest every day. I, I really believe in that stuff you've just been speaking about. I think there's something much more powerful out there if you can open up yeah, your, yeah. your mind to it. Without a doubt. I mean, I said to you, know, I think with me, I mean, it's, it's one of those, one, one, one of the uh, things with my lad, and then touching on football is like, you know, he'd have this thing against me like, because you're at, you're, they always say, don't you? When you're the coach, you're harder on your own, aren't you? My lad had that, but you know, he technically he was a better player than me, young, you know what I mean? And United looked at him when he was younger, Leeds, even Spurs, and still got the, the, the scan reports now. Yeah, yeah. You know, Jordan Dwyer, technically very, very good, but just does enough. Just does enough. You've seen it yourself, you know, it just does enough. Mm -hmm. But you can't just do enough. 
But then as a dad, obviously, you're trying to drive him. But my era as well, you know what I mean? The way, you know, probably like your old fellow, you know what I mean? If you give you a, if you give you a rollicking, you'd probably take it a bit personal. And sometimes, because he was a bit sensitive, my lad, which I didn't really touch into, it, it, would all, it would all that against me, you know what I mean? And that was one of the things, like you say, the guilt, and just like, you know, well, you're probably too hard on him, and should he have done this, and should he have done that? So what I'm doing all this now, and the transformation of me, because I am going through my spiritual journey, you know what I mean? I'm doing my Reiki, doing my Reiki levels, and I'm in my sound baths, you know what I mean? I've done my exactly. crystal ball things, and I'm, I'm proper into it. Like you say, you go through these different things to look for things, but with this, I feel that like he is, he's, he's driving me to say, yeah, this is the man really that you can be. Do you know what I mean? So that's my coping, my coping stuff is like, becoming probably more spiritual, writing more, you know. You touched on it a bit when you said, when you shown the lads, talking about football, CC, you told them about them. Because I sometimes get when people say, oh, is this and that, the footballers, you've got this, you've got, you know, they don't do this and they don't do that. And I go, they're not lost a kid. You know what I mean? And people go, that's a bit harsh. It's not harsh. Because one of the things that I felt like I, I, I lost Dean was like sometimes me empathy and where people say to me oh I've lost my mum I've lost my dad and be like oh I am an empath I'd go oh, I'm sorry about that da, da, da. not the same not the same people say have you been for grieving counselling and people have said to me oh, well I'm a grieving counsellor well have you lost a son you lost a daughter no well, and I can't I can't like you said you touched you went on that cafe to that place to see them people like minded people and you could talk because you all have that thing. You all have that thing. Now, like I said, I've lost my mum, I've lost my gran, lost my brother. Do you know what I mean? And that grief. Man. But when you lose a kid, it is different, isn't it? And I, 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 I can connect within 10 seconds of someone who's lost a kid. But when people say to me, I've lost my auntie last year and I go, people say to me, oh, yeah, I'm sorry about me. I know you feel because I lost, I, lost, I, lost uh, I lost my uncle last year. All right. Oh, no. <laughs> it's, it's horrible, isn't it? Because I feel sorry, but you don't. But and in the football world, it's the same thing. The lads are da, 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 da. But I think it is that thing that sometimes I use it and I go to say, lads, listen, you know, when they are feeling a bit down and try and motivate, I'm not being funny. I'm not I'm not being, you know, I don't want to upset you at all. But I'm coming in harshly and said, what are you going through now? Yeah, you might have tweaked a ligament, you might have done your ACL. Today's technology, the science behind it, everything, you can come back from that. When I played, you did your ACL, career was over, done, done, done. That's how I would go, double, double ACLs and, and, they, and they play. But I said, it would drive me now if I, was a, if I was a player. The fact is that nothing can hurt me now because I've lost my son. So I might do my ACL or I might have been dropped from the team or I might have had, been, been sacked. Do you know what I mean? So for me, when, you, when I heard about you saying it, you, you push yourself on for that. You never forgot. You, you, you'll never ever forget. And I, Daniel said you you were you were a hero. Because like I said that's that 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 man thing in it. Because we've got to look after you. Got to look after Danielle. You have got to look after the other kids. And you do you forget about yourself, don't you? Yeah, it's a good point. You know, my old man's a, he's one of them. My old man never had a day off work in his life. Just like no no excuses. Mm. We all know Northern grit. All that. That's why mm. why I loved it so much down in Charlton. You know, South East London because I, I thought it'd all be a bit Cockney and all yeah, be a yeah. bit, but the. Down there, South East, they're just like they are up here, Manx, Scousers, Glasgow, you know, proper salt of the earth. My old man was like, you need to be the man of the family now, you know, you've got to really man up and you've got to be there for Danielle and the kids and get through. And absolutely, I would say the same to mine if it happened, unfortunately, yeah. but there was a point where if I wouldn't have looked after myself and brushed this under the carpet, I was I was going into the press switch line. I was in. I was walking into a midlife, uh, I always say midlife crisis, I was walking into a... Um, I can't think of the world now. My head would have just, my, head, my head would have completely blown off. Yeah. Like it would have. So I needed to grieve at the same time. And that's not easy, is it? Because your wife's going to pieces and, and your kids. And, and obviously it affects all your family. You know, we we because yeah. it was the first morning of the holiday, you, you normally ring your, well, we always used to ring my mum next morning and say, Right, we've got there, we're just going on. So yeah. my brother uh, that was over Matt that was over with us had to ring my mum to tell her and the grief, the guilt that I've got for putting that on Matt for him to ring my mum and then yeah. it's that knock on effect and it's your brain playing tricks on you and I went to a counsellor and she was like that must have been tough and I just you said it there about connection I could not connect with these counsellors and I found this psychotherapist again she was a volunteer Julia 
She'd been into prison seeing people who had all these personality disorders. There was a something about her that I buzzed off. She was a bit like a bloke and she spoke like a bit like a bloke. And I really connected with Julia. Yeah. And that's how I got into psychotherapy. And that's how I learned about how your brain works and your amygdala. And basically, you've got to get it under control because it will play tricks on you. And you'll lie there at night. And all that matters then is you wake up tired because you've not slept. And then you're in a bad mood and you, and you end up losing your job. And you, so you've got to get a grip of it. And that's why we threw ourselves into And I'm really lucky or we're really lucky that we both you know if one of us was really spiritual and into all the stuff we just spoke about and one of us was like what are you doing all that nonsense for that, that was probably the quickest way to divorce weren't it so yeah. i think we're lucky that we're on this journey together to answer you you said something before and it really resonated with me where some days it's like i just said to you there dinner before we were on an air the guys how would my mates turn up to do the roof because there's something leaking in and it's like some days it's like that would send me over the edge nearly like I need to go and meditate for 10 minutes because, like, I've lost my daughter, Cece. Why the fuck does this have to happen now? Yeah. But then today it's like, it's all right. No one's died. No. So I don't think you'll ever – I don't think I'll ever get to the point where I'm over this no. and everything's great and I become this, like, big guru. I think no. it's literally the biggest roller coaster of all time that you can't get off. And you've really got to enjoy the, the moments, haven't you, the highs, yeah. because – you know, you, you're probably around the corner from something going a little bit wrong and you just got to be able to, you got to be able to get over it. And and I, there's nothing better when someone comes up and says, like, I listened to you do whatever or I saw you doing that and it really helped me when you spoke about this. And, you know, that cliche you said before about if one person listens, like, yeah. I've really bought into that. Yeah, yeah. If mm -hmm. one fella or, or kid or lady or anything is listening to this chat, and goes, bloody hell, these two are in the public eye. And, they, you know, wow, wow, that's how I feel, but I've got no one to talk to. And you know what, Trev? Without the public eye that we've been in, it yeah. would it, it gives its own pressures because you have to go and perform under this. But I think it might be more difficult when you're not, you know, and you've just got a dead-end job and you kind of, like, you can't really open up to your boss because they'll that's right. probably sack you eventually and you can't get time off and you can't. I think you would literally be, you can't be in your own head for too long, can you? Totally, totally give that. I said, you know, before I've, I've spoke to the lads and I said, listen, the thing is about my podcast, I don't, it's not like other podcasts, normal podcasts, whether it be football, sport, anything, music, where you recruit and you ask people to come on. Do you know what I mean? You can't, you, you, or I might say to someone, this is what we feel like talking about, it. you know, we do this podcast and people go, yeah, that's not for me. It's not a problem, not a problem. But then, so with us, we usually get people who have listened to us and other people have sent it on to people who think, that might help, you know, Dean, Trev, Paul, whoever. They'll have listened to it. And then they'll say, oh, yeah, I've got a mate here. Do you have a word with him? I'll say, do you fancy it? And they go, yeah. Because, again, it's that thing about there is a shift. It's getting better, but there's still thousands. Going back to the football, and it's just like we interviewed two kids here, and they've got this team. I don't know if you've heard called Angels United, right? No. And the team consists of it. Really weird. Me, me and Paul went down to see them. Oh, I think I went on my own first of all, and they were playing in uh, they were playing uh, Ashton under line somewhere. And I went down and just to see the kid, and uh, there was twenty two players on the pitch, referee, linesman, blah blah blah. So at the time, the kid come over, said, "Oh yeah, I'm Trev, you know, from the podcast. We're having a chat later." And he goes, "Yeah, because ask your question because how many how many players have lost their lost their children? I'm thinking he's going to say one or two, right? Oh, oh yeah. I'm like, what the fuck? Oh, so they're all wearing the shirts, but they've all I just noticed they all had the names of the children on the back of the shirts, not their own, who they lost. So he was like, you know, Stephen Rubin or went like that, Melanie, blah, blah, blah. I looked at the opposing team, they were the same. I looked at the supporters, only about 30, 30 there watching. They were both the same. And it's like, it's mad thing that come into your head. And they go, mm, do you know what? I'm mad it is. You could have a World Cup of lads who have lost their dads from all mm. over the world. They could be teens. And that's how my head was going. I was thinking, because when you're outside of that, you don't really think, because chronologically, like you say, we go great-great-grandparents, grandparents, you say it again, parents, da 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 We don't think of that, do we, the kids, and it's spin on your head. So I'm going, I'm watching a match here. 22 of these blokes have lost their kids. Multiply that by thousands around the world. And because mm. it's football, you could. You yeah. could be, you know what I mean? The dads, I don't know, mad, the dads who've lost lost the kids World Cup and thinking, you know, there's millions of kids. The clearly, of blokes, 
there's clearly a shared purpose there, isn't it? There's clearly that's what gets them out of bed on a Sunday morning or whatever yeah. it is, like you said before. Yeah. That gives them that, you know, the living, the carrying on the life in, in memory of and that. And, you know, we, it was a moment where when I found gratitude for what I've got and had, as opposed to Mr. Angry waking up and yeah. first thought in your mind every morning and all that, one of the groups that we spoke about, we went to one in Bolton as well, and there's a lady there lost three children, not at the same time either. She lost three children over about six, seven year period. And you do come away thinking like, wow, how do you deal with that? So there was a moment, it wasn't explicitly around that, but that was part of the process and, and say manifesting and talking to the universe yeah. and all this mad stuff that you do. People talk to themselves all the time. It's just when when it's around the child, people think you're losing your head. You're not here. People, it's just, it's just a way of coping, I think, but I've always done it. Yeah. And when I genuinely, and I can't tell you the moment it was, it was a couple of years ago, had this feeling of gratitude for having CC, for being lucky enough to be able to have a child in the first place, by the way, yeah. which some people can't do. And all these types of feelings, you kind of like check yourself a little bit and are a little bit like, come on then, you got to make the best of this now. Yeah. You know, there's, there's four of, we've got four other children. And again, it's that conversation, Killer, isn't it? How many children have you got? Oh, do I say four or do I say, well, we've had five. We've had five, we've only got four because... And most people melt and don't know what to say. Yeah. But if you never say that ever again for the next 30 years, like you'll never, ever speak about her. So yeah. like you said, you're forgetting them. So she deserves to be spoken about. She's just not able to continue her life. Yeah. That's the way That's the way it is. And if it's not good enough for other people, then you know what? So what? Yeah. You know, we're not, we're not here to kind of sweet talk our way through life. We're here to have a proper conversation and be honest about our life. And if someone says to you, all right, the answer could be, all right, mate, or... You know what? No, I'm not. To be fair, yeah, yeah. And that, and that's that's what I've been Paul said to it. People used to ask me, "How are you doing?" You go, you know, to be brave. Yeah, I'm all right. Now I go, as it is, hour by hour. I said, if anything, I probably start using this phrase a lot. I walk in fog, and every now and again, it clears, and the sun comes out, and then the fog comes back again, and I'm in a mist. Do you know what I mean? That's what I try to explain to people, and they go. Oh, I don't know. I said, just the way it is. Just the way it is. I said, but because of probably getting more spiritual, because I'm 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 talking to my lad on the on, on the level, because I'm talking to other people, that does help. It's the cliches that do me editing. Like you say, oh, Tom's a great healer. One kid I went to the kid said to me the other day, Tom's a great healer. I went, fuck off. <laughs> the old Trev came back, I regressed to it. Yeah, he's like, fuck off. <laughs> and he went, oh, I went, oh, sorry, sorry, I didn't. I shouldn't be acting like that. It doesn't, mate. And it never will. Time never makes it easier. What we tend to do is we learn around it. Learn to live with it. Yeah, we learn around it. It's never, you know, when they go, time is time, that, da 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 But I know it's just... Uh, there was an old fella yeah, called Bob. I keep going back to the... Because I like real-life stories rather than, like you said, there was a fella called yeah. Bob, this old fella. He'd lost his daughter. He was... At the, it was 26 years ago he'd left, he'd lost her, so it's probably 30 years ago now. And he was talking and he and he <laughs> he uh, people dispersed and someone had gone to the toilet and Danielle was chatting to some other parent and me and him just got talking in the kitchen and best conversations you can have, aren't you? And he said, and he looked me in the eye and he probably felt bad saying it, but I'm so glad he did, because he said to me. He said to me, You'll you need to understand that you will never be the person that you were before. You need to give yourself a break. You will never. Don't put pressure on you to be that guy. Yeah. And I found it really like, well, you can see that it's like, I, yeah. Yeah. I look back and we've got pictures all over the house as we all do. And me and Danielle's kids when we first got together and this young footballer and this budding TV star, CITV and had the world, our oyster. Genuinely, I could cry for the pair of them. Like, I feel really, they didn't know what was coming around the corner. Yeah, and if if you were watching us in a movie, you'd be watching it going like young sweethearts, and then we split up, and then we got back together, and I broke my leg, and then we had a couple of kids and three kids, and they're going on holiday, and it looks great, and best mates, his brother's his best mate, and her sister's her best mate, they get married, everything's, and then like you, if the movie cut off at that point, and there was a sequel, you'd you'd walk home with popcorn, going like they're they're fucked them too, like they're they're, yeah, and it's a. I don't know if it's a, 
sounds a bit harsh, a bit geographically, but I don't know if it's a Salford thing or, but it's like, this is not going to break us. I am not prepared to be a stat where my marriage breaks up because I became yeah. an alky or I became reliant on whatever or, because that's, that's the reality of it. It really is. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and we're no better or special than anybody else. We're just prepared to fight through the darkness. Yeah, absolutely right, mate. And I think that, like I said to you, you know what I mean? You know, forge your journey, you know, and I've listened to it more, more, Again, it's like I relate, I relate, and I don't know about you, mate, but it's pretty weird. I said to Paul, sometimes I get pretty ultra sensitive about my mates who got the kids, and they go, like for mate, for example, he's talking about his daughter wants to go to Vietnam. She's twenty seven, right? She's, she's, she's talking about going to Vietnam. She's not having that. I'm not having that. I'm like, what are you on? No, she, she's not doing that. I went, it's twenty seven. Said, let her go. Yeah, but yeah. I said we never had the opportunity. The world was a massive place when we were young. Now it's a lot smaller place. I said, you know what? I'm just saying to you, let it go. Because if you don't let it go, and in Japanese philosophy, there's no such thing as regret. It's a case of you make a decision, and from that decision is a positive or a negative reaction. I said, and if you make the decision where you stop her from not going, and she takes that on board, and that becomes then within her, and it manifests, that could be a negative, mate, which could ruin your relationship. She's got to go. And I find myself, like, adopting <laughs> my mate's kids. No, I suppose it's because it's been me loss of that I've enjoyed, and especially some of us, I suppose, you know what I mean? Like, But, yeah, I, I, I think how you deal with it is 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 superb, mate. And, you know, it does give it does give help to lads who are becoming members of our club that we don't want to, we don't want to belong to, and, you know, and what, what can be done, and if we can, like I said, help them a little bit, you know, how do you, how do you feel when you, when you hear people say, oh, dads don't talk? What, what What's your response to that? I just try and, I don't believe, it's an old-fashioned thing, I don't believe, like anything, it can change. But it, it's like it's like anything, it'll only change if people make action. Like, you can go out there and, and tweet, or you can, whatever you want, you've got to go out there and, like, if you want to change the world, like, change yourself and change the next person next to you and it, it, it's just a little bit like that it's like yeah, yeah. it sounds a bit of a bold statement doesn't it but like, if you if you really believe in it get out there and, and live it then you know, yeah. we can all be this guy that wants to talk about this to talk about if you really believe in it get off your ass and, and try and make it happen so I really I'm really passionate about it because I know for the reasons I've spoke about and the people that I've come in, in touch with since CC died that my life could have been a whole lot different like you know I've had I've gone on you know, my biggest pride will always be my children and still be married to the love of my life. It, it, it really will be. But career-wise, I've gone on to be a manager. I mean, we, I walked out of Old Trafford this just uh, eight, 15 months ago as a manager of Charlton Athletic. I was watching I've you. Been, I was on the other side watching you. <laughs> I've been in every corner of that stadium since yeah. 19, the early 80s. With my old man, I've been a ball boy. I've stood in the scoreboard. I've sat in the Stretford paddock. I've queued all night for tickets for the 94 Cup for like... Brilliant. And then you do... And, I really enjoyed that moment and part of me just lost my mum prior to it and, and part of me was like, I wish CC could be in, I wish my mum could be here. But then my dad was there who's been going United for 70 years. Can you imagine the pride in his son? My brother was there, my sisters, yeah, yeah. Me, all my kids. Daniel, like, you re- The reason I tell you that story is because like, for, for a long time you sit in grief and guilt and think, I can't go. I, uh, I can't go and have a good night out. I can't go and have a nice. I mean, we obviously she died. On, every experience is different. CC died in Land so getting on a plane, yeah. going on an holiday, you know, all mm. these weird things that your brain mm. plays tricks on. Yeah, you have to overcome because you could sit in the house and never do anything in your life ever again, and and because your brain th- tells you that you should be feeling good. Because if you go and have a good time and go and have a night out and and forget about them for a couple of hours, a couple of days, who, how can you do that? You can't be a good dad. How could you? Someone. Shown me that very early, just come to me then, very early that they were able to kind of talk, talking like they could just done there, like back to work and going and all. And I, and I genuinely, Trev, sat there, I genuinely was like, You obviously didn't love your kid as much as I love Cece. That can't be possible. That is not possible. I'm yeah, not having it. Yeah, yeah. And when you can overcome that bit and go and embrace and enjoy your life and try and strive and be ambitious and, and not be cooked up in all this fog, as you very, very well said before. Otherwise, you're trapped. Yeah. I've got other children I've got to be there for. I don't want to become a mess. I don't want my kids to grow up. We've got a youngest, Chase, who's five. I don't want him to grow up and go, my mum and dad were class. Yeah. And then, maybe, you know, they, then they weren't. I mean, that ruins their yeah. lives. 
Yeah. I saw the 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 video on your uh, on your Twitter at the airport when they came over <laughs> to see you. Mate, I was uh yeah, I saw that last night and that's just I, I love I love stuff like that. And the older I get, the more emotional I get about everything. They're not even my kids. They're not my kids. Why am I getting emotional? <laughs> but that's a beautiful, beautiful thing to see. You know, smiles on kids' faces. And they were the obviously thing, happy to see that. you, which is nice. <laughs> thanks, Paul, yeah. The best thing to come out of that, I've probably gained another follower, ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So listen, mate, obviously, like you say, obviously, just to conclude, I'm just going to give you the, the, the last question, but it's been great, mate, and so, so... You know, appreciating me, open like you're saying, chatting, and you know, I know your story will res- resonate, which a lot of them do on here. But you know, obviously, I think with us being in the football, a lot of my mates do football. You know, I mean, that, that's the question I got. They went, "We spoke to any footballers who've, who've lost their, their children?" I said, "Funny enough, I got Dean Alden trying to get under Dean Alden." So I'm sure that'll, you know, for the right reasons, that'll that that'll bump up the the, the, the podcast listeners. But it's been great to, to to speak to you, mate, and. You know, you know, wish you every other success where you may go on to, despite you working for the Scouser. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, funny story. Last last Sunday we were we were over there. We we live about half an hour from Bahrain, so you can go into Bahrain and you can go and have a meal and, and a couple of drinks if you want. And we watched the game together when United oh. scored last minute. My lad was in. Ah. I still got my season ticket. I still got my season <laughs> ticket. I've had since I was fourteen in Stratford and yeah. my son, my oldest Joey, was there. And he FaceTimed me just after the. Oh, after he scored the winner, and I'm sat next to Steve, and it was it was a surreal moment. Let me tell you, face of where it was. <laughs> yeah, how long's my contract? Yeah, well, um... <laughs> yeah, I better back down. Isn't it? <laughs> so, mate, so last question we're going to ask you, mate, and like you say, you know, within a small, beautiful time that you you had with CC, but is there any one particular favourite moment that steps out from all the good moments, the great moments that you had with her? I mean, it's probably too many, isn't they? But yeah, of course there is. Yeah, I mean, Daniel used to say, "Put your phone away," because I was constantly filming. I'd never done with the two older ones. I was filming everything, and I'm glad we've got about two hours of footage now that we would never have had with just mad mm. stuff. But yeah, uh, and sometimes you're filming one of the other kids in the house, and then she just trots by with a little like push thing or whatever at like 12 months old. So you've got all this great footage. She was born just before Christmas, 12th of December, at home. Daniel had her at home, and. um yeah, cuddling her. I've got a video of me cuddling her on the sofa. We always did the skin mm. to skin, so I'd be sat there with me top off. I was in better nick then because I was a pro. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I've got you cuddle, cuddle all of them, and um, yeah, that, that's probably the that's probably the, the the best memory. I mean, I think yeah, the hardest thing is I said to Joey and Ellie who were the two firstborns that we had. It was that Damien Rice song. Joey was born two thousand seven. Damien Rice did a song, Blower's Daughter. And it was my favourite song. I used to sing it to them all, putting them to bed at night. I just used to sing it to them. And I sung it to Joey, then I sung it to Alice, then I sung it to Cece over the years. And I've never been able to sing it to Mitzi or to Chase since. And I've never, and I think it's important, I know you're trying to finish on a high, but I think this is a really important message, this. Yeah. I need to overcome my own journeys. Joey, Ellis and Cece, I said to all of them, I looked them in the eye and I said, I will always... I promise you, I'll always be there for you. I'll always look after you like you do your children because you don't you know what's coming. Mm. And I've never wanted to say that. I never had the nuts to say that, to see, uh, sorry, to mix or to chase because I don't want to lie to them because I don't know if I can be there for them like I want to because life had its own little way, doesn't it? Yeah. But um, it's just something that crops into my mind. Finish on a high. Finish <laughs> on a high. One of the parts. One of the little videos I've got of her, one of the little videos I've got of her, she because she was only tottering away because she was only 17 months when she passed, she was she'd be say the odd word, and I'm stood there with a little teddy that she used to carry around that was filthy, it was bogging, and she I'm going, come on, she's going, da 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 and she comes running, Danielle's filming it, and she's like totting away to me in the living room, da 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 and then she I'm thinking she's going daddy, and I'm stood there, my arms are crouched down like that. She goes right past me to get. Teddy on the floor behind me. <laughs> oh, no. One of the things in the video that the kids, the kids love to see. That's just unbelievable. <laughs> cool. You was going to ring me, your friends, they say. When? What day? What week? What month? Sometime in May.
but you didn't get time because your time ran out before you could scream, talk or shout. Discuss the stupid reason why a son and his dad fell out. Your body may have gone away, but I converse with you every night and every day. Sometimes for 10 minutes, sometimes for hours, in the sun, the cold, the rainy showers. I sit at your place. I refuse to call it your grave. I watch as the fresh flowers wilt. I pray that you're warm in your sacred quilt below the frozen ground. I shout at the universe. I plead with it to swap us around at night. Chronologically, this ain't right. I feel guilty should I laugh or smile. I feel like I'm in a room with no windows or doors. One hour, I'm okay. The next, I'm a mess in a puddle on the floor. My eyes start to sting. My throat is dry. Sometimes I feel I've no more tears to cry. But that's an illusion as my face becomes wet every day since you went away. To a better place, people, they say. In your religion, it's quoted that your time is preordained. But whoever decided that, did they not consider the pain for those of us who remain? What about the tradition that's conditioned in our brains from when we were kids that our parents would be the ones to meet us as we travel to the next world to be reunited again. But hold on, let me reiterate before I say goodnight. This isn't chronologically fucking right. So... Until we clasp our hands within each other's palms, like the way you gripped my finger on the day you were born, firm and tight, I shall walk around this world with an unrepairable hole in my heart and a pain which can't be healed. I cry to die to be with you. I cry to stay alive too. To help my beautiful daughter, your sister, escape from being consumed by this pain until, like me, she reunites with you, but not for decades and decades and decades and decades. I couldn't be selfish to put her through it again. Therefore, one sweet day, is our song I shall sing from now until then. I thank you, Mariah Carey, and boys to men. Thank you for listening to this episode of the exclusive club that Dads Don't Want to Belong to podcast, hosted by Trevor Dwyer Lynch, produced by Paul Ludden, and proudly supported by the Manx Spirit Charity. Please subscribe to our podcast, and if you can leave us a review, that would be much appreciated. Thank you.